we reach Egyplosis. When I recovered my everyday senses, the revolving motion of the aerifer had ceased and our flight was confined to an undulating movement. I was holding the hand of the goddess, who had been in a hyperesthetic condition herself during the gyrations of the ship, and, when feeling her senses leaving her, she had involuntarily grasped my hand. Our souls had been the recipients of the same rapturous joy. When we were once more ourselves, Leone was anxious to know something of the character of the women of the outer world. I talked to her about such women as resembled herself in spiritual fervour. I described the Egyptian legend of Isis, the goddess of love, of nature. I told her of St Teresa, that blessed visionary whose soul frequently experienced those voluptuous sensations such as might be experienced when expiring in the raptures of the bosom of God. I spoke also of Pearly Eve, to whom, ere she had eaten the fatal fruit, every moment was a delight, every blossom a wilderness of sweets. I spoke of Cleopatra, the haughty daughter of the Nile, the fervour of whose passion thickened into lust and death. My story was interrupted by the arrival of the captain, who said, Your Holiness, we will reach Egyplosis in an hour. So soon, murmured the goddess. Is it the pleasure of Your Holiness that we alight at the private sanctuary or at the Grand Gate? inquired the captain. At the Grand Gate, of course, said the goddess. We must give our friends a royal welcome. The captain bowed in obedience and disappeared. The charms of our journey grew more and more interesting. In addition to the delights of discovery, I felt the rising ambition of great joy in connection with Leone. It was a daring thought that I might possibly partake of a glorious camaraderie with the goddess, but when I thought that no stranger could possibly share a heart that belonged only to her people, only to Atbatbar, I felt that Leone was very far off indeed. In a land where spiritual love was the prerogative of the priestly caste, strictly limited to members of that caste, any priestly condensation or favour given to those outside the pale of the priesthood could have no meaning and was forbidden under penalty of death. Of course, human nature is liable to err always, and it came to pass that the records of the legal tribunals of Atvatpar proved that many departures in soul fellowship took place between the most loyal inmates of Egyplosis and the outer inhabitants. The punishment for such offence to the most sacred law of Atvatpar, although terrible, was powerless to prevent such mesalliances of the soul. I knew that a spark of what might prove a mighty conflagration was already kindled in the bosom of the goddess. It thrilled me to know it, but only as the laws and customs of this strange country became known to me did I realise the tremendous risk in Leone allowing her heart to betray any kinship, however remote with mine. The greater the dignity, the greater the offence. The crime was sacrilege, and the punishment was death by the magnetic fluid. The goddess already belonged to her faith. She was love's religieuse. It was a cruel thing to seek her love when I knew it would perhaps bring her to an untimely end and stamp her name with everlasting disgrace. On the other hand, if the goddess, knowing much better than I the result of loving one not only outside the sacred caste but an outer barbarian as well, was brave enough to incur even the risk of death on behalf of her love, would I be so cowardly as to not follow her supreme soul even to martyrdom itself? And it might be that we might even raise a following large enough to defeat our enemies, an end in a greater triumph than either of us ever yet experienced. Such were the thoughts that filled me when the aerial ship suddenly shot out of the chasm in which we had so long travelled, and emerged upon the wide circular basin of the mountains about 100 miles in diameter. In the centre of that high valley lay an immense lake, in whose centre stood a large island, everywhere visible from the shores, whereon stood the sacred palace of Egyplosis, the many-templed college of souls. We saw its pale green gleaming walls rising from a tropical forest of dark green trees. Its golden crystal domes reflected the sunlight dazzlingly, making the palace plainly visible all over that wide valley. Egyplosis was a little city, composed of an immense quadrangle, the Supernal Palace together with the Subterranean Infernal Palace. The Supernal Palace was of enormous dimensions, being a square mile in extent, and was composed of over a hundred temples and palaces rising high in the air, the chief seat of soul worship in Atvatbar, and the home of twice ten thousand priests and priestesses. The Infernal Palace consisted of one hundred subterranean temples and labyrinths, all sculptured like the Supernal Palace out of the living rock, and situated directly underneath it. Our course lay in a direct line across the noble valley. It was the most diversified part of the country we had yet crossed, being broken up into hills and valleys, glens and precipices, fields and forests, lakes, islands and gardens, all composing a region of bewildering beauty. The emotions awakened by my near approach to this strange place were keen and exciting. Now, for the first time in history, its mystery was about to be disclosed to alien eyes from the outer world. 
Soon after entering the park, we saw, some 50 miles to the north, the ship containing the sailors rapidly approaching Egyplosis. It had also escaped destruction by the cyclone, having doubtless followed us down the canyon we sought refuge in. It was a new sensation to float bird-like over the enchanted fields in this most mysterious of worlds, towards a spot that has no prototype on earth. A multitude of domes and crenellated walls grew into immense proportions beneath the boundless light. Egyplosis possessed in its palaces the enchanted calm of Hindu and Greek architecture, together with the thrilling ecstasy of Gothic shrines. Blended with these precious qualities, there was a poetic generalisation of the mighty activities of modern civilization. It was the home of spiritual and physical empire. I wondered greatly what Eleusinian mysteries its courts contained. I was indeed another Hercules visiting the realms of Pluto and the gardens of Proserpine in the quest of the immortal fruits of knowledge. Would I be successful in my quest and bear back to the outer world some magical secret its nations would be glad to know? Finally, we saw the clear and marvellous palace close at hand. A hundred banners floated from its walls and music from an army of neophytes on its towers saluted us. The air of us swept over the lake and, reaching the island, alighted on a marble causeway leading to the grand entrance of the palace. A thousand waylails stood ranged on either side as a guard of honour. We had left the forest that largely covers the island and on either hand stretched gardens of rainbow-coloured flowers and here and there fountains sparkled in the sunny air. Leone seemed the impersonation of divine loveliness as she was borne in a litter from the aerial ship to the palace. On her head sparkled the bird of yearning, typical of hopeless love. The high priest Hushnoli and the priestess Zuli Soas of the supernal palace and the grand sorcerer Chaka and the grand sorceress Thubul of the infernal palace, surrounded by the chief priests and priestesses, magicians, sorcerers, wizards, theosophists, spiritualists, etc., gave us a royal welcome and were jubilant at the return of the supreme goddess to Egyplosis. End of chapter 27